um, public hearing is uh, for the Community Center Feasibility Study Application to the Vermont Development Community Program. And I'll read a paragraph that Barb just handed to me um, in reference to that. The Town of Waterbury Notice of Public Hearing. The Town of Waterbury is considering making application to the State of Vermont for a planning grant under the Vermont Community Development Program. A public hearing will be held at the Waterbury Municipal Center, 28 North Main Street, Steel Community Room on April 2nd, 2018 at 6.45 p.m. to obtain the views of citizens on community development to furnish information concerning the amount of funds available and the range of community development activities that may be undertaken under this program. The impact of any historical or archaeological resources that may be affected by the proposed project and to give effective, affected citizens the opportunity to examine the proposed statement for projected use of these funds. The proposal is to apply for a 45000 in VCDP funds which will be used to accomplish the following activities. Uh, the Town of Waterbury will be applying for planning funds to con conduct a feasibility study for a new community center that would provide opportunities for an in intra general generation multifunctional facility, a recent Waterbury visioning summit sponsored by Revitalizing Waterbury in January 2018 indicated a desire to have space and programs available for seniors, children, teens, adults, and families. Revitalizing Waterbury and Waterbury Senior Center are active partners in this application. The feasibility study would include priorities for types of, of services and activities, other potential partners, estimated costs of programs, estimated scope and cost of a facility. Potential suitable locations with a priority for existing municipal prop property, a cash flow analysis and possible sources of grant funds to help implement the project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Barb. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the potential um, for the community center project. Um, this is something that came up a number of, um, actually it came up a few years ago, and as a concept and um, as a result of some additional input uh, from our recreation committee, um, we've been working with Revitalizing Waterbury um, on a potential new senior or expanded senior center. Um, and the Children's Room has an, is an existing organization that's been looking for a home for a while. There are other groups. There's one that's represented here tonight, um, an arts community group, um, looking for space in the community. Um, the overriding and overarching intent um, to be looked into the feasibility study, the key words are intergenerational and multifunctional. So it would be something that could be used by all ages, all sorts of different programs, um, and different times of the day and, and uh, weekends. Right now there's um, an overloading on summer camps. <coughs> kids that are trying to get into the summer camp program um, are limited to the number of kids, um, to 80 that can fit on the site down at the recreation fields. The building can only hold 30 people in the building, but in the summer they have outdoor space. Um, the Senior Center also does Meals on Wheels. Um, they are squeezed for space and looking for different facility. Um, and as I mentioned, the Children's Room and then the Arts Center. Um, so this is just a feasibility study. Uh, we're looking for 80% funding 
um, from the Vermont Community Development Program. The public hearing is a part of the process that you have to have a public hearing if you're applying for these funds. They're actually federal funds that come to the state and then the state issues them out. Um, this project came to the select board a few months ago to ask uh, to, apl to uh, consider applying for the grant and the answer was yes to consider applying for the grant. This public hearing is a part of that process and as well um, tonight should you, uh, uh, one of the other required things that we need to do is assign a resolution on behalf of the select board and authorizing bill to sign it as well um, as part of the application. Uh, we've been working with Steve and Steve's been working with the planning commission to identify needs in the community. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to yeah, this. Yeah, I'll needs. just speak briefly to that. Um, the planning commission discussed the project uh, at their last meeting at uh, the end of March and um, they uh, authorized Ken to sign a letter. Uh, the letter deals with both conformance to the municipal plan and also uh, to their support for the project. And uh, we have a copy of the letter here in the file. And uh, they did take that action. They feel that it, um, all of these programs, specifically our uh, summer recreation program, other recreation programs, support for the senior center, and um, the children's room are all in the municipal plan, and so uh, they endorse that. I'll just talk briefly about this uh, program. The application is to the Vermont Community Development Program. Uh, they're the program that administers the federal community development block grants. We used a uh, significant amount of that uh, funding in our flood recovery, as, uh, as I think you're aware of. And uh, the match also for this uh, grant, we're uh, requesting a $45,000 grant of um, the Community Development Block Grant funds for this planning, uh, planning grant or uh, feasibility study. And I would be matched with um, 6,000, this is what's proposed, $6,250 in uh, revolving loan funds, approximately that amount. Uh, these are also Community Development Block Grant funds that are, um, in um, a town account and a village account right now. And then uh, the additional match of 5,000 would be uh, in-kind staff time. Chris? Yes, sir. So just to uh, follow up on what Barb and Steve just said, uh, the, the in-kind time uh, is the only taxpayer contribution to this portion of the project. If we decide to go ahead with it, uh, it will mainly be Steve's time and Barb's time as they work with uh, the consultant, whomever is uh, hired to do this feasibility study. Um, we have capacity in the department to do that. You know, the, the work plan that Steve had can be adjusted um, and Barb can fit this time into her schedule. So. Uh, Nobody's suggesting that there's no cost to the municipality, um, but we're not going to pay uh, staff anymore. It's just that they will have some of their time directed to this if we go forward with it. The, uh, the match of the CDBG money that we have, the $6,250, I think we have about 9500 in that account right now. Um, that the genesis of that fund was a loan that uh, a CDBG grant that was made initially to the town and village jointly for Pilgrim Partnership, I believe. Um, and we're in the several generations down the line of using that money. We've used that same CDBG fund to uh, partly fund the seminary building project in Waterbury Center. And then right after the flood, we had, the town had about 70, Village had 74,000. The town had $151,000 of that money just sitting. Uh, there are strings on that money. You can't use it for anything except uh, housing, economic development, or community development projects where there's uh, at least 50% of the beneficiaries will be low and moderate income folks. So it's, it's been hard for us to get that money out into the community. And after the flood, uh, the select board and the trustees both uh, 
used all of the CDBG funds that the town had in its coffers to lend to the Lad Hall project down on Main Street to build that housing project. How many units there, Steve? Uh, it's, I think, uh, 20. 27, 20. 20, about yeah. 7, 20. So um, the, the town and the village both lent their full CDBG money back to Lad Hall. Um, <clears throat> the seminary building project has been, they've had two different loans, an $80,000 loan and a $20,000 loan. Uh, they've paid off both now? Well, all this <clears throat> they've paid off all but about, uh, I think, $5,000 yeah. approximately from the $80,000. Right. So the, the money that uh, the town now has in its coffers has been being paid back by the seminary uh, building loan. Um, as, as we just indicated, that's close to being paid off. One of the loans is completely paid off. The other one has a little bit of way to go. Neither of the loans from Lad Hall have started to pay back yet. Um, Lad Hall borrowed some money from the village's UDAG fund as well. Uh, that amortization schedule has started. Uh, there may be some payback from the Lad Hall project to the two CDBG loans beginning this year, but uh, there's a complicated formula about looking at the financial position of that land hall project after their audit is done for the 2017 year. So um, there's not very many opportunities that we have to actually circulate this money. Uh, one of the requirements of the of CDBG is uh, if you have CDBG revolving loan fund money in your coffers, uh, they're reluctant to grant you any additional money unless you use a, a component of that. So we, we thought that uh, the $6,250 that we talked about was a reasonable amount based on what we had in, in our coffers, uh, and that's how we'll pay for the 20% local share. Okay, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, seeing as how this is a public meeting, the public's welcome to speak. Uh, okay. so Carol, we'll could you come up to the mic, mic, please? Uh, I know, <laughs> that's a pain. <laughs> okay. So, a question about the, uh, the Waterbury money, the, the revolving loan fund. With these other projects like Lad Hall, the seminary building, some other entity is paying back the loan. This this and would not be this would not be this would not be a loan. This would be the municipality using it for an eligible municipal function um, towards this towards this project. You can't use this type of money to uh, build a facility. You know we couldn't use this money when we were going to build a fire station. But doing planning and and uh, feasibility studies is an eligible project. So this would not be a loan back to the municipality. Um, it's not a loan to the project. This would be an expenditure of those CDBG funds. That wasn't completely clear before. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Karen? Wobbling around. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, Karen Miller, Waterbury Center. So. I'm really curious about some aspects of this. You know, when we did the fire station, when we did the municipal complex here, one thing we really focused on was a big push for meeting space for people and space for people. In the library, they were very adamant about having enough space for programming and that the community could use this space. So I find it um, a little hard when I was on the board and we had these discussions, why we're coming back to the community now and saying we need more space. We need more community space. Because that was a really big selling point when we got those bonds through. So I have some concern about the legitimacy, legitimacy of that. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, I think it's, it's one thing to say that we're not putting any money in, which I had not realized that before we came here tonight, that's why we have public um, meetings like this. 
that the town's not putting any in, but then the bottom line is, is even if you go through this whole feasibility study, you put all this effort into this, it's going to be a huge project. And how much more as a community can we absorb, all right? So this municipal complex was a huge project. And it was an effort to get it done. And again, one of the selling points was space. I mean, we have this really nice space. So that's my concern. One is, we already have meeting space. Why aren't we utilizing the space that we have? And then two is, how much more can we absorb as a community, particularly if people are really interested in doing something with police? It's going to become overwhelming as far as taxes go. Well, speak, speaking for. Um, staff and then Barb can chime in. I, I think all your points, Karen, are, are spot on. They're very reasonable and it's clearly something that, um, you know, not only have I heard that from the board and from members of the public, but also have communicated that to staff. So just so you know, from our perspective, the space that we have in this building is well used. This room has, uh, you know, we have uh, meetings in here uh, many days during the week outside agencies outside organizations come in and use this space we have had concerts in this space uh, the cell room in the library is well used the recreation program has used that space uh, the obviously library programs have used that space um, the space that that we're talking about now is a little bit different type of space in that, you know, we really can't run a summer recreation program out of this room. It's an office building. It's, it's not intended for, you know, children of school age to be in here during the day. Um, going back long before you were on the board, even to when Carol was on the board, you know, the issue that we had with the, with the scout hall is that it, it holds 80 people. We used to squeeze over 100 in there. Uh, that's a little bit more problematic to do now with some of the requirements that we have. And then we have other requests for space in, in the community. And this is not, you know, I'm not suggesting that it's the town's obligation to figure out how to, uh, to provide this space. But in recent years, we've had uh, conversations with visits from the Senior Citizen Center, they're looking for space. We, we just talked about the recreation space. And then uh, going back to when we recovered from Irene, the community uh, arts uh, space was something that we looked at. And, you know, uh, part of the spinoff of that was what uh, Monica Callan and, uh, has done there with the, with the Grange space. But there are people in the community who are looking for different space. So when a number of uh, weeks ago, back in January, I think it was, I actually called Karen Nevin from Revitalizing Waterbury and Deb Fowler, our rec director, in to meet with me. And I just said, I'm hearing a lot of talk about community centers, senior centers, uh, recreation centers, I said, there's no way that everybody can have one of their own thing. The only way this could happen, if it can happen at all, is to combine forces and find out if you can use one space. And uh, I had read an article uh, about a uh, community in Massachusetts, and the Senior Citizen Center went to the uh, city council there and said, <coughs> You know, the senior center is old and it's, it's really in need of an upgrade. We need a new one. And the city council just said, you know, we just passed a bond issue for a new school. There's no money to do this. And one of the counselors said, well, why can't we put the senior citizen center in the school? And, you know, they can share the cafeteria. They can share the auditorium space. You can have seniors in with kids. So I, I just had that kind of thought in my head that, can it be a multi-generational, multi-purpose space? And told Karen and Deb that the only way this could happen, if it was going to be considered at all, would be to combine forces. And then, you know, after that, Revitalizing Waterbury held its uh, 
community forum, and many of you in this room were at that. I was at it for a few minutes, and it came out. That was a recommendation, and there's, you know, we looked into it. There's an opportunity, but this is a feasibility study, and I, I need to emphasize that. And from my position, and I'm just speaking for myself here, um, using as a local match the CDBG funds that we have a hard time getting out of the bank into the community. Um, if that's what our investment has to be, uh, to see whether this is indeed feasible or not. I mean, we don't have a lot of land. We don't have um, you know, a lot of money to do this. And I just want to be clear that signing up to do the feasibility study doesn't mean that the project is going to be coming next year or five years from now. It's really meant to tell us whether it's even feasible to consider going any further than that. I think one thing I'll add is uh, part of the study is going to be a public process. So this is just an initial conversation with the public <coughs> in the, at this public hearing. So um, you know we intend to engage uh, both different um, organizations in the community, formal and informal, <coughs> including the Senior Center, Children's Room, uh, our own Recreation Department program, yes. and the general public. So I just wanted to reassure people that that is a requirement of these grants, uh, just like other feasibility studies that we've done. And so uh, we would really uh, seek input and, um, you know, at all levels to help um, see if the project is feasible. And it will be a holistic study as well, not only, you know, identifying who would use the space, how much space would be needed, how much it would cost to build that space. The bigger question for me is how much does it cost to operate that space and who's going to pay for it? Because, so, you know, there's, there's yeah. little appetite even from staff to say that the operation of such a facility will be the public's responsibility. So, well, can I can I just address this a little bit? Um, the feasibility studies, exactly as we've all heard, um, a huge component of it is figuring out <coughs> what are the program needs, what are the program costs, who are the program users, and how much is it going to cost in doing the business plan for the entire project. So, if it I mean, if it comes down to the community to shoulder that cost, it's going to be a non-starter right out of the gate, um, unless Chris Viennes wins the lottery, and then we heard that he might do I some nice things. just missed the last one, so. But I mean, that's got to be a solution, and how is it going to be self-sustaining? If I can just expand on that a little bit. So that's one of my concerns, mm -hmm. is who's going to pay for these programs? Yes. Another concern is, are we now going to have yet another staff position? be the director of this whole thing, because it's going to be a little complicated. Um, number three is, if you look in the context of the other things we got coming down the pike, including a desire on the part of some people in this community to have a full-blown police department, which is going to cost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be over a million easily, if not more. The kind of center you're talking about, I mean, my goodness. We're not going to build that for a million dollars, that's for sure. No, but if we have a plan that looks feasible and so, five years, ten years down the road, it lines up and somebody's a huge benefactor, you never know. And another grant. Well, yeah, that, and that's, that's why I'm not, that's why I'm not going to stand here and say, yeah. let's not do the study. But I also yeah. know from experience that if people don't start to voice their concerns from the get-go, then when the bond comes down the pike, they said, well, we had all these public meetings and nobody yeah. said anything. So yeah. that's why I'm yeah. curious to let you know that there is concern, and I've certainly talked to people, and there's a lot of concern about this. Okay. Anybody else? Everett? Everett Coffee, Winooski Street. Uh, we keep looking at the feasibility of doing this or that or whatever, and the amount of money that has gone into various projects in Waterbury, uh, whether revitalizing Waterbury with the pushes on it or whether they weren't, have been some very good projects. A 
However, my thoughts at the present time, and I've talked to a number of people over the last week since I got the agenda, and I spoke with someone tonight about 5.30, who is about 73, four years old, a uh, very professional individual, retired, and uh, I've talked about sidewalks, I've talked about roads. Unfortunately, yesterday morning about five o'clock, he fell on a sidewalk in Waterbury Village, and he didn't come tonight because he's got skinned hands and other parts of his body. But he said, I'll tell you one thing, it might may not be there tonight, but I definitely will be there when there's a vote to either totally go ahead with this thing or not, and I will be voting no. We've got roads in this community that are in extremely poor, unsafe conditions. We've got sidewalks that go even beyond that. In fact, I had someone who, I haven't even looked to see who was here tonight, but uh, said he was really concerned and had hoped at town meeting I would bring up the Winooski Street sidewalks because of my wife's fall, et cetera. But I firmly believe that it sounds nice for Bob and Steve and Bill or whoever to polish this apple and it's such a big unknown that until we get our roads and sidewalks, our debt load down, and I'm not questioning Bill's skills and ability, but we owe X, uh, I think it would be inappropriate and unacceptable at this time to move forward with a feasibility study and that was for $45,000? A grant application. Yep. Grant application. And that would be just for the study. Yes. And as the Miller girls had said, uh, and I was pleased and a little surprised of your concerns. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've disagreed before. Uh, I just think that the art programs are fine. Yes, the seniors would like more space. But on Front Porch Forum, you look on there and there's a advertisement that probably once a week or more for the YMCA camp in Waterbury. I don't know what it costs or who can get into it. And the other thing as far as uh, the preschoolers or the kids that come from Duxbury, Moortown, and other places, swimming pool wise and other activities, some of them pay and some of them don't pay. And as I said in an email, which I sent to Karen at Revitalizing Waterbury, why are we so excited about building bike paths and walking paths, for example, from here to Little River, and people come here Friday night and they may ride or walk on the, side, on the sidewalk or, or drive on the roads a little bit, but they leave on Sunday night, go back to the state that they came from, really doesn't cost them a dime. Now local taxpayers are paying a fee. And yes, I don't disagree. The reservoir, probation pig, uh, Alzium, Bluestone, et cetera, make money, which is what you're in business for. I was and made a little, uh, not as much as you guys do. But anyway, I'm still surviving, getting three meals a day to sleep, place to sleep. But uh, I really strongly recommend that uh, you think long and hard on this as a select board before you put your stamp of approval on it. And if you don't, I think you're going to see people coming out and surprising you, people that are opposed to it. So with that said, uh, being on a select board, being a chair, is not something it's a uh, project that you're going to be making everybody happy. It's not a priority to be popular. It's a, it's a popularity to be and make and do the right decisions. And I hope you do that. Thank you. Um, I apologize for being a little bit late. Is there a match on this? This is a $45,000 grant? Yeah, it's yeah. actually a 25% match. I was thinking of 20% of the revolving loan funds, but it's a okay. 25% match yep. in front of you. Yeah, there should be a handout there. Okay, that thank you. About. I see it here. Um, Chris? Yeah, I just want, is any of the rest of the public interested in speaking at this time? Yeah, yep, go ahead. I was just curious about, you know, does this opportunity come up? Oh, I'm John Boyer. And uh, I'm, what I'm wondering about is, does it, is this is an opportunity that's come up in terms of being able to apply to this grant specifically? Um, yep. 
Is it an opportunity? Yeah, in other yes. words, you know, like as other issues and concerns get expressed, there sits this opportunity to look mm -hmm. at this one thing that doesn't necessarily address how maybe the city is working with sidewalks or other things. Is that right? There, there are a number of different grants out there in the community, in the state, and in, in the federal world. And they typically go on uh, scheduled rounds, so that twice a year, three times a year, four times a year, once a year, you might have an opportunity to apply for something. Um, this particular one, they have uh, four different times of the year that you can apply um, for these funds. It is a competitive application. Um, you know, they can be applied for in the future, but you never know if it's gonna be timely or not with other applications that are out there. As far as sidewalks go, this is not a sidewalk or transportation related grant. There's other ones for that. Um, there's just about a grant for everything you can think of out there. But this one is for really community, community type issues and the focus is on low to moderate, in, serving low to moderate income individuals. Um, not all of them, but a percentage of them. Yeah, so if, we, if the town was successful in getting this grant mm -hmm. and moving forward, does it diminish the town's capacity to continue to work with these other uh, issues of Not at uh, all. transportation and so forth? No, and in fact, we have transportation grants, side, another sidewalk grant up towards um, the intersection with Blush Hill, Stowe Street, and Route 100. Um, you've got a planning grant out there. We've, yeah, we've got other grants, so it does not diminish. Mm -hmm. And does the community stand to benefit from the process of the feasibility study, even if it does not congeal a actual brick and mortar building? Yes, it's huge because if down the road, you d if it doesn't turn out into anything, we can't afford it, it's not gonna work, there's not a leader for it, we don't want to hire additional staff, um, there's a plan in place. It's a feasibility study that results in um, a basis for going forward. So five years down the road, 10 years down the road, assuming this building's paid for or other things are paid for, um, and other opportunities come up, there may be large grants out there that sometimes come available. And you can say, hey, we've already, we're gonna dust it off, this is what we've got as a basis, we'd like to then update it and go from there, um, if the timing's right. So it's, it, it's something that's documentation that gets you one step further in a direction, whether that direction is to go forward or that direction is to not go forward. Yeah, but it, and it also is, a, it's learning as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so don't you learn about maybe some of those other opportunities that yep. may be out there or better utilization of spaces that exist for yes. the groups interested? Yep, absolutely. Or even bringing the relationships of those entities closer together, even if it doesn't. All of that. Yeah, so. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I'll just add, we, we've done feasibility <laughs> studies like this for the, uh, the railroad station, which is now owned and partially operated by Revitalizing Waterbury, and along with Curie Green Mountain. Uh, so there are, many, there are examples. The Snips and Graves building was funded in large part by Community Development Block Grant, where the senior center currently is. So over the years, uh, over the 25 years I've been here, you know, we've done numerous feasibility studies, and it doesn't mean that the municipality takes on those projects. They're often um, ones that we may initiate and other organizations uh, help out. Sometimes we do, in, in all honesty. Sometimes it's, it's oriented towards business development, such as with Keurig Green Mountain. But it definitely is about uh, partnerships and trying to build uh, capacity in the community, um, not just uh, municipal capacity, but other capacity. That actually covered what I was looking for. You know, we heard from Deb uh, a few months ago, not very long ago, um, the recreation director about how the successful and how the rec programs have been uh, and how they've grown in the last couple of years since she's been there. It's not very long, but um, I mean, the question that we had was, you know, can we grow them anymore with the capacity of the facilities that we have, the pool and they're trying to make do with using other locations for kids' programs in the summer. And, um, and she said, no, we're really maxed out. Um, the only way you can really grow these programs is to get more space, a more appropriate facility. Uh, we're kind of making do with a lot of um, bits and pieces. 
in a, in doing well, we're lucky to have the pool, you know, for all of its um, problems. It's um, as an aging facility, it's it's terrific. It's really the center of recreation in the summertime. So we're maxed out, and we are like a town that has a growing elementary school population, where all the other ones around are shrinking. So this is a town with young parents, young children, young families, and people are very recreation minded in our population. So I think um, I understand what you're saying about the concerns and and I and I appreciate the point about that this study could be a way to point to um, some kind of solution or some feasibility of bringing other people together that it's not run by the town. Maybe there's some other entity that would step forward or could be formed by interest groups. Who knows what that is, but that's what the feasibility study. I, I think help with. I think that given what we heard from Deb, I think we I think we need this study because I think we need these programs and they they can't just stay static for kids. I think. Yeah, and in referencing that same I think meeting that Deb was here for, the question was: Is there a model that doesn't have the costs? without the income that we're currently seeing with something like the pool, where the pool is very much in the red, and if that was a 365-day facility that didn't have it, the cost to turn it on and off, is there a model that once you do the upfront investment, you actually save over where we are currently? So that's something the study could hopefully tell us. I also have concerns that when we, ha we don't have enough, we don't have enough space for summer recreation programs for kids and the families that don't get into those programs, what kind of costs they see for childcare, and are we pr currently providing, when you get into the program, a very affordable childcare option in the summer? So I would like to understand something like that in this as well. So I mean, for me, the small investment for education and understanding what this could look like and how it would look from a P&L perspective, I think is an important education process. So maybe I could just interject. I think uh, once you, we get through the public looking for, uh, oh, we have some more comments. I was just going to talk about the resolution, but go ahead. I don't know that it's quite on. Is it on? Oh, there, sorry. Yeah, My name's Whitney. I'm a resident and a small business owner. Um, I'm here with three of our 12 steering committee members that are trying to get a collaborative space in town to um, help people meet, learn new skills, and to make things. It's not necessarily an art center, just want to clarify that, um, but people can make art there if they want. Um, I just want to ask the committee if they could add some points into the feasibility study, because we do definitely support this. Um, that was directly related to um, creating space for making things in, um, because that is definitely a multi-generational support function. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work in the three years that we've been trying to get this off the ground, and we'd certainly share some data that we've collected. We've got over 100 community members that really want to use the space we're in the conundrum of finding the space. It's what we're missing. Um, so we're eager to help support this group as much as possible. Just wanted to let you know that and ask if you could add a component in to talk about making space. I would probably, I want to get uh, language to put in here because instead of making things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We can meet later about that too. Yep. Is it clear that, I mean, this study could um, include adaptive re reuse of existing buildings? Sure, that's it's part of it, to right. look at um, uh, spaces on where it might be feasible, mm -hmm. options. Yep. So, yeah, Steve started to talk about a resolution. Um, I handed that uh, resolution form to you, Chris, in advance, and should you decide to go forward as a board, <laughs> A, a resolution would need to be approved and signed, and then Bill would sign it. Well, I want to hear from many of the other board members, and then I'll speak there uh, briefly if we could. Um, You're all set? My questions have been answered. 
So I'm going to be the bad guy, I guess, tonight. Um, make it a habit of that lately. Um, we're talking about feasibility studies and whatnot. Um, Carol brought up earlier, and Karen both, the uh, issues, and I think the board all knows from our budget uh, go around this year of the things that we're going to be faced with coming down, you know, next few years here in front of us. Um, I'd like to see the feasibility, feasibility study on how we're going to pay for the millions of, and I mean millions of dollars behind on infrastructure costs that we are currently at. Um, you know, if we throw the ambulance service in with this, the police department in with this, 51 South Main Street, I'll go, just go over them again. Uh, you know, equipment replacements that are part of our CIP that we put into every year. Um, at some point, our pool is going to need some, it's been needing, and eventually is going to come to fruition that it's going to need some major, major replacement um, or reconstructive process. Um, it seems, I understand that this is a feasibility study, but my fear is that it's going to end up in the lap of the taxpayers. Now, if there was some way that we could put an amendment to this uh, um, contract that uh, would uh, take the responsibility of the municipality, the taxpayers, of footing the bill on this thing, if it comes to fruition, then I would uh, sign it wholeheartedly. But at this time, I just, I can't see how, with everything we've got coming, I'm, I'm in fear that it's going to get thrown in our laps. Um, and I don't understand how anybody could, we can't continue to just walk away from the responsibilities that we have uh, in paying for them to, to take on something else. And I understand. Barb, it's a feasibility study. <clears throat> My concern is just opening that door. And what's going to happen? I mean, I'd like to have more information as to how, and probably, probably that's part of the study, how it's going to get paid for outside of taxpayers' dollars. You know, I have these uh, facilities for the things I do and I pay dearly in taxes for them every year to the town of Waterbury. Um, and I just wish there was an ability for, you know, maybe all these people that you're talking about to get together and pool the money, come to the table and say, we've got this, can you help us in a direction um, rather than working it the other way around. So unless somebody can guarantee me that the taxpayers of the town of Waterbury won't be on the hook for this, I'm probably not going to sign it. So a couple of things. In the grant application, it, w it would not be appropriate because nobody's asking the taxpayers to pay anything. It's just a feasibility study. Where it would be appropriate to include something like that would be in the RFP that will go to out, um, we'll put requests for proposals out to firms that can do a feasibility study. And in that feasibility study requirement in the request for proposals, put in there that this will not, um, whatever comes out of this, will not involve any taxpayer dollars, municipal taxpayer dollars. That would be the place to put it. And if it comes out at the end of the feasibility study that this can't be done without taxpayer dollars, um, it's the end of the feasibility study. If it comes out and says it can be done without taxpayer dollars, but you'd have to do a big capital campaign like the library did, and they contributed over a million dollars for this building, a capital campaign, other grant uh, funding out there, other opportunities, then potentially this would move forward. But that would be the place to put that language in that request for proposals to be specific, that it not include taxpayer dollars. All right, well, having said that, then I'm going to ask the public that's here tonight, um, are you comfortable with that being said, that uh, those conditions get put in mm -hmm. at that time? 
Like I said, I'm not really totally opposed to this. I do worry that it is opening the door and it seems like once the study gets done, then the train is on the tracks and headed out the station. But I can appreciate that in reality, it's a, it's a study to see if it's possible and see what the possibilities are and if there's a lot that could be gained from it. I, I do have a little concern about saying there are no taxpayer dollars involved because there are. We have Steve's time, and we pay for his time. Yeah, we have Barb's course. time, we, sh we pay for her time. I don't know about this community grant thing. I mean, that is, well, it is taxpayer tax dollars. Money from the federal government. Yeah, so it's federal money, so none of us pay yeah. federal taxes, so I guess we're okay with that, right? <laughs> so, so I would just like the record to be corrected as we talk about this to not say there's no taxpayer dollars okay. involved. That bothers me. I'll well, have to work on some creative yeah, language well, for that. The, okay. I'm basically looking for uh, a no increase in municipal tax rate to go towards this thing. But That's my big concern. And I'm a member of the public too, and, yep. and I'm not, I, I understand and I hear what you're saying. I think that you should either allow the feasibility study to go forward and let the chips fall where they may and get as much information as you can as opposed to restricting the information. Because ultimately none of these projects, including this building and the fire station, is done without the public's approval. And, you know, we had a hit with the tropical storm and our tax rate went up. But for the last three years, we've kept the tax rate level. Uh, we're paying for this building. We're paying for the fire stations. Uh, we're paying for the rec director that we've added. So I think to, to, for this board to say to the public, well, we're only going to consider things that we're not going to have to bring to you is really not fair to the public's process. The public gets to decide how much they want to pay in taxes. And you know, your concerns, Chris, are reasonable. And, and uh, you know, back long before you were on the board, we had a lot of discussions about the fact that our society is pluralistic. And some people like want to spend every cent that they have on the road system. Other people want to spend a lot of money on a library. Other people want to spend a lot of money on recreation. And we have to balance and, and cobble something together that we all ultimately can support. I think it's unlikely that such a project could happen without the town being involved. And given what I know about the police and a lot of the infrastructure things, it would be a big hill to climb. But I don't think there's any harm in giving the public information so that then they can use their brains and decide, well, this is important to me and that isn't, and I think it's more important for the community to have this, and that's not as important. And they vote with their heads and their, their pocketbooks. But, but saying to, we're going to go ahead with a feasibility study and then take something off the table before we even do it, I think that's very short-sighted. Well, to your point about, you know, people's priorities, some people want to put money into this, some people want to put money into that, or put money into roads. I don't want to put money into roads, but our roads are at the point where they're just in total disrepair. Uh, and you know they're as well not, as I do. They're not in total disrepair, Chris. Okay. There's, Bill, we have we problems, could, we've had this discussion they're before. They're not in total disrepair. Not close to total disrepair. All right. I, I think I've heard enough of the discussion going around here. It sounds like um, none of this money is stealing money from anything else. It's a little used pot that has very limited utilization. This is an appropriate use for it. Uh, the match uh, to uh, your point with regard to the staff time is long as you are comfortable that that amount of staff time is manageable uh, given the current workload. I would make the motion that we approve uh, the uh, municipal manager to sign the application resolution for the feasibility study. And the rest of the select board would sign it too. Is there a 
second. It, don't, it, it doesn't uh, take any money other than it's all grant money. All, I mean, except, grant money is our money, but. Except for the, the time that staff will have to put into it. If they put the time in it, that's one thing. And as long as you ain't spending money for something that we ain't, we don't need yet. We no. need some, a lot of things before we spend it. Oh, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, motion been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could I get you to pass the resolution to those? I don't know. It, it passes, so I would assume all five of you would sign it, or does Chris not sign it? It's up to him. Yeah. Can sign it or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So then now you close out the public hearing. Yep. Okay. This portion of it, of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Okay, so I'll close out the uh, public hearing and uh, call to order the uh, select board meeting for Monday, April 2nd, 2018. Um, 7.38. First thing the on, on the agenda is to approve the agenda. If everybody has looked through it and is in agreement with what's there i take a motion to approve it please i'll make the motion to approve the agenda as presented i'll second okay motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. consent agenda consists of minutes of march 19th meeting uh, liquor license for butler street pizza craft beer cellar Old Stagecoach Inn, and outside consumption permits for Hollow, ho Cold Hollow Cider Mill, Thatcher Hill LLC, and Country Club of Vermont. The outside consumption is for Old Stagecoach. Oh, it's just for the Old Stagecoach? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't clear on that. Okay. So, with that clarification, somebody make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Joint business, public. I'll call the uh, meeting of the Waterbury okay. Village trustees to order for uh, Monday, April 2nd, 2018. Okay. Now, um, public, uh, doesn't look like anybody is interested in speaking yet. Um, consider 708, we're well past that. Consider the adoption of the local energy operations plan. Emergency. Okay. Sorry about that. Emergency, yeah. Okay, um, so this is my other hat, emergency management. Um, every year there is um, an update of the local emergency operations plan that goes on file with the state. Um, this has important phone numbers in here um, for the first person to contact um, in a community. Um, Bill had been listed as number one. Bill Woodruff had been listed as number two. We had an occasion with potential flooding. Um, I reversed the numbers so Bill Woodruff, who is the official local emergency management director, gets um, called first in the event of an emergency. Um, even though I took action. Even though you did take action and <laughs> sent pictures. I was impressed. <laughs> Ice Jim. Um, so anyway, what happens is this goes on file with the state. 
if a disaster or some kind of an emergency situation occurs, um, it means that the, the town is eligible for a um, share for the emergency relief assistance funding. If you don't have a local emergency management plan in place, you don't get, um, you get a smaller share of that funding. Um, it also means that you're eligible for another of, uh, a number of other grants that may come down the road, like the generator grant, which is um, being considered now. So with that, I think everybody received a copy of the local emergency management plan dated 2018 with some updates. Um, I found out today on one of the ones that listed three mobile home <laughs> parks. Bill Woodruff informed me that um, the mobile home park that's up off of High Street area, most of the homes, if not all, are out of there now. So I made a notation on my copy here that um, that is closed or almost closed. Um, so there are only two mobile home parks. Um, the school information has been updated. We now only, uh, it used to be um, Bridget Goodnow and Stephanie Hudak. Stephanie's gone, so just updates. So with that, if you, it's a town and village um, emergency operations plan and it would need to be approved independently or by both boards. I just had one other little update. On page five, you did reference the village police. Oh. So you might wanna yes. that. Yes, I'm sorry, page, that I overlooked that. And on page six, you talked about law enforcement, so that was okay, but okay. refer and then you had state police referenced it periodically, so that was all okay. appropriate. Oh, in the narrative. Yep, okay, I will clarify that, thank you. So is it inclusive town and village under one contract or they have to be separate? It's one plan, but both adopt it. Okay. Independent. So we just need to make separate motions then. For now, so next year, the, one. the next one. Yep. One. Right, on behalf of the select board, I'll, move to adopt the local emergency operations plan with the edits as uh, as noted during this discussion. I'll second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the local emergency operations plan, please say aye. 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 I'll, I'll make a similar motion on behalf of the village. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, to adopt the emergency uh, operations plan for the town and village of Waterbury. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next thing on the list, uh, consider authorization to borrow in anticipation of taxes. Yeah, this is... Uh, just a pro forma request, um, maybe a little bit of new information for Nat. Um, the village and town both are on a calendar fiscal year and our uh, major source of revenue far and away is property taxes, which we're not able to send bills until July and we don't collect until August and November. So um, the, the cash flow is very heavily weighted to the end of the year. Uh, we we get quarterly payments annual uh, quarterly payments from the state for uh, aid to highways, but in the fact that the total is only about one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year, it's you know uh, not even thirty thousand dollars a quarter, and um, we have to pay bills all the way through the year. Um, in the old days, we used to typically uh, borrow around this time of year upwards of a million dollars from the bank. Uh, we would borrow, say, at 2%, and then we could turn around and put the money back into the bank at 2.5% at and would earn a little bit of uh, float for a while, and that quarter of a percent or a half a percent uh, would reduce our interest expense. Mm -hmm. You couldn't ever make money doing it, but uh, you'd be able to reduce your interest expense. Uh, we're in a very different situation now, uh, both in the town and the village. The town, mainly because we put aside so much money into our capital improvement funds, and we typically don't spend those until later in the year. Um, we have reasonable fund balances in those funds. And it just kind of has evolved over the past several years that 
We typically have been starting the year with close to a million dollars in the bank. This year we were actually further ahead than normal in terms of our cash at the beginning of the year because uh, many accountants advise their uh, clients to prepay their taxes because of the federal mm -hmm. tax law change mm -hmm. and the restrictions on deductibility going forward. So uh, we don't have to borrow anywhere near as often as we used to. And in fact, when the last time we borrowed from the bank, <coughs> um, rather than borrow big slug of money and then pay it back at the end of the year and have that big interest expense, we just would uh, negotiate a line of credit and draw down on it when we needed it. Uh, now, the last three years, I've recommended to the boards just to pass motions to authorize uh, staff, myself, and the treasurer to borrow money uh, intermunicipally. So the village right now has more than a million dollars in its uh, coffers. It's unlikely they're going to be able or need to spend that money. Uh, the town is still in the $700,000 range, so it's going to be a while before the town really needs any money either. But when we do need to borrow, if the, if the occasion uh, presents itself that we have to borrow, my recommendation is to allow uh, the borrowing to happen between the municipalities. So if the town has to borrow $50,000, uh, use the village as a line of credit, and when we pay the interest, which gets paid, it stays in the community rather than going to a bank. So I would ask both boards simply to pass a motion allowing uh, borrowing in anticipation of taxes and allowing staff to, uh, to borrow from uh, one municipality to borrow from the other if, uh, if that's possible. Your motion would allow me to go to a bank if I had to, if for some reason you know, borrowing requirements were so high that the other entity didn't have enough money to lend you, but that's very unlikely. I'll make a motion uh, to, con to um, authorize borrowing in anticipation of taxes, as you've described. Second. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded to uh, allow Bill to um, borrow in, antici in anticipation of taxes, um, either through the bank or through other sources within our town. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Waterbury Arts Fest. Wait a minute. Oh, village has to do I'm it. sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry, Skip. We're getting the money from them. Yeah. Hold your horses. I move we make some of the motion for the village. Second it. Second it. The motion has been made and cited to authorize the municipal manager to borrow uh, funds in anticipation of the village taxes. Um, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, I guess I'm just trying to catch up to the clock here and it ain't going to work, so I need to slow down. <laughs> Karen. I'll be quick. Hi. Um, Karen Nevin from Revitalizing Waterbury, and this is my annual request from the select board in the um, town for the road closure for the Waterbury Arts Fest uh, weekend of July 13th and July 14th. We have been running this event. This is our 17th year. Uh, well, the event's 17th year, Revitalizing Waterbury is about seven or eight years since we've been running this event. Uh, we closed Stowe Street and Bidwell Lane and uh, for a great uh, party and arts fest. This is a primary uh, uh, fundraiser for revitalizing Waterbury. We raised about twenty dollars to $25,000 at this event towards our operating dollars. And of course, the more operating dollars we can raise elsewhere, the more likely I'm gonna be able to ask you for less money in the future. Not yet, though. <laughs> um, a couple of things just to identify from last year. Uh, we are uh, learning from our, we have some growing pains, we have some learning experiences. I just wanted to uh, highlight for you, um, last year we had uh, larger numbers than we've ever experienced before. The town experienced some real parking and parking issues that weekend. It wasn't purely our problem. We had lacrosse tournament and traffic just came to a stop um, going up in, into Stowe. 
But because of that, we've identified a few things we want to do, including creating some real parking um, signage. I want to talk, work with Dina to put up um, day of parking signage, directing people to municipal lots, for example, the lots here, and telling them to walk down to um, Stowe Street so that we don't have people double parking on um, Railroad Street, which I know that happened last year where literally it was impassable at one point. Not something I was, I'm happy about at all, um, and we were, it was identified to us. So we're working on some parking issues uh, to solve that problems. We've also identified a number of organizations that run um, events at the same time, trying, uh, really sort of getting on the bandwagon of all the people coming into town for the arts. And we've created an event partnership with those uh, different organizations. A classic one is Jeremy and Georgia Ayers and their artist is designer event. They had 500 people come to Elm Street. We've talked to Georgia and Jeremy and we're talking about, okay, we need to work together so parking doesn't become a problem on Randall Street and traffic and all those kinds of things. So I want you to be aware that we are very, very aware of some of the um, sort of issues that came up during the Arts Fest last year. Uh, we, um, yeah, I think that's everything. Do you have any questions? Well, I, I wondered if you'd consider the elementary school for parking, too. Oh, we would. Yeah. I, would I mean, we're going to um, look at all the different kind of... The other location that would be ideal would be the Green Mountain Coffee lots right. um, that are, ver are basically empty um, during the weekend. And uh, what I would really love to do is put signs at either end of town as you're getting off the interstate that say, WAF parking, WAF parking, and literally direct them right in here, or direct them from different locations to these spots, and then signs in the parking lots that say, walk three minutes, <laughs> walk two minutes, and tend them out that way. So it means a great deal of signs for 24 hours. We'd probably, you know, we'd put them up probably around three o'clock or, you know, midday on Friday, take them down at 6 p.m. on Saturday, but really, work to get people who are coming into town. We saw up two to 3,000 people on Friday night and another two to 3,000 on Saturday. Uh, so with that many of people and cars, we need to get them safe places. So outside of the standard permit for what you're asking for, this, this sign issue, and, a, and I could care less either way because it wouldn't, I wouldn't bother me either way, but is there a permit issue for, I mean, how does that yeah, get well, handled? You know. Karen's idea, this is the first that I'm hearing of it. I'm sure it's being talked about. And we'll have conversations with Dina. I'm not here to say we can do it or should do it or shouldn't do it. It's, we're going to have to think about it a little bit. Um, we've had discussions here about signage, um, you know, uh, off-premise advertising, and, you know, I know it's a one-day event, and I'd like to be accommodating as best as possible, but if you allow that, then when somebody wants to put up a sign for the flea market, well, it only happens once a week. Why can't we put our signs out? So the sign issue is, is a little bit of a nuanced thing, and we'll have to work together to see if there's a way we can make it work. I would say that what I'm saying is we know that there's a problem and we are actively want to solve it. And it's not going to be solved tonight. It's going to be solved by me talking to the people and figuring it out. But I want you to know that we are very aware that this is a problem. We also have a trash problem, but I've got that one solved. <laughs> So. I wonder if you could put a map on your website too. That's part of, yeah. and but we do put maps on websites. I mean parking, uh, but yeah. with parking locations, yeah. people don't pay. Attention. No, no one pays attention to them. They really need it as they're walking into town. Um, so, and we can hand out maps, but they're already parked in in this location. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Somebody'd like to make a motion to approve the Waterbury Arts Fest. Dates again, Karen? It's July 13th and 14th is for the closure of the streets. And actually, now that I look at it, because I didn't highlight it on my piece, we are looking for an extension, a uh, one-hour extension for the noise ordinance on Friday night for the party. That, didn't you guys ask for one? Not that I, again, We've not that I always care, asked for it. You've always given it to us. So and it's the same thing. It's exactly it's just, the okay. same. And I'll tell you, last year at 5 of 10, they were begging me for two or three more songs, and the band knows. 
They unpull, they pull the plug at 10 o'clock, and we will not go beyond that. It's very, very important to me to respect the residents in town. I'm going to recuse myself from the vote. Sounds like a booth. <laughs> I will uh, make the motion that we approve the um, request by the Waterbury Arts Fest for uh, street closure and uh, uh, other related incidentals for the time period July 13th and 14th. I'll second that. First Stowe Street in Bidwell Lane. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much, and put it on your calendar. This is a question for Bill. Uh, if, if all goes well and the village goes out of existence, is the entertainment permit and the decibel, does the town have that in place? Or I don't think so. You'll have to hire Lefty and his uh, <laughs> sound device to police it. So is that something they would eventually need to adopt if they? It's, we'll have to. See whether they do or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to ask that too. I, I guess I would ask the trustees on a preemptive measure to approve this request in case for some reason the charter amendment doesn't pass. <laughs> Good request. We should do this now. Yeah, I, yeah, I think just that in case. just in case that village doesn't really go away on June thirtieth. That. <laughs> You're on record supporting it. You want to do that, Lefty? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I move we approve the amendment as proposed. For our fest on July 13th and 14th. Okay. Second that? I'll, I'll second that. The motion has been uh, made and seconded to approve Arts Fest as requested for July 13th and 14th. All those in favor say aye. Hi. Uh, good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, because previously all those closures went to the east track. Okay, let's have a little discussion uh, about the municipal manager's salary adjustment. Okay, so. before you do that exactly, let me let me pass this out. This is not anything to do with my salary necessarily. Um, again, for Nat's benefit, this is the time of year that uh, annual raises typically go into effect if there are any for municipal employees. Um, we have a 30-day appeal period for the budget after town meeting. That appeal period will be the 6th or 7th this, later this week. So um, um, salary adjustments typically take place The pay period right after that 30-day period ends. And um, from time to time, I present this information to the board. I think it'd be important or interesting for you to have it. Um, the state statute is clear that the municipal manager has the hiring authority and the ability to uh, set the compensation for municipal staff. Um, the request on the, on the agenda tonight is for my salary adjustment, if there's going to be one, and I'm just, I'm not comfortable setting my own salary. So um, the, uh, the staffing and the pay ranges that are on this list are um, kind of updated for inflation. Uh, these are just for most part, their salary or wage ranges. There are a couple of positions where we only have one of, so even though it's a range, there's only one person there. Uh, nobody's um, uh, actual salary is listed on this page except for mine. There's a couple more here if anybody needs them. So, um, as I said, uh, the municipal manager's authority to set uh, compensation levels and staffing levels is limited, of course, by the budget. All of this that's on this page is within the budget, and there's not significant changes in any one of these particular line items. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking, and uh, I did 
Jane, you sent me an email earlier today on January 21st when I included a packet in the budget notes, I did talk about the fact that um, the CPI um, inflation rate increased 2.1% for the period ending 12-31-17 and that um, for the most part that 2.5% uh, was assumed um, as a wage increase for, for the in, in general, not an across the board raise, as this says, there'll be employees that will get little to no raise. There'll be a, uh, you know, a couple that get raises that look high, but when you compare where they are on the wage scale with other people in the organization, and uh, typically what I've tended to try to do when uh, raises are put into effect, uh, we do uh, employee evaluations. Uh, that's, uh, we try to make that part of the process every year. But I also recognize the fact that the people at the high end of the wage scale, if you simply gave an across the board uh, percentage increase, you know, somebody who makes $25 an hour is gonna get a higher raise than somebody who's making $20 an hour, even if they're doing the exact same job. And, you know, part of that spread is seniority. But over time, if you're really uh, doing what you need to do as an employee and you're moving up the, the learning curve, if you will, you know, the, the, the premium between a, a more seasoned employee and, and somebody who's a, a, a more of a... Uh, less experienced person should narrow over time, you know. So if you're a, in a position for, you know, 20 years and then somebody's in a position for two years, well, there's probably a big difference in your skill sets. But if it's 20 years and then the next person is, you know, 12 years, that, that gap in learning has changed. So I try to usually give a bigger raise to people who are making lower wage rates, otherwise they continue to get further apart over time. So that's that. You can have, ask questions tonight about it. You can ask questions of me at any time about it. Um, and as I think I expressed <coughs> in the past, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with how I'm being treated personally by the town and the village in terms of my compensation. I hope I'm performing satisfactorily at least to the board's, uh, you know, in the board's opinion. Uh, I'm not in a position where I was two years ago when I came to the board and said, you know, I haven't, I've had a four cent raise in the last four years and, you know, I, I was feeling a little bit uh, neglected, I guess. I, I don't feel that way now. So I'm, this is not intended to be a big demand, it's just I have to sign uh, the paperwork to put these uh, put raises into effect and I'd rather not be the one deciding what I'm going to be paid. So, so the 5%, you said the range here is from 1% to 5% contemplated. Is the 5% contemplated for the um, employees on the lower end of the pay scale? Is that what for you the, said? There's, there's only one or two, Jane, that would be that high, and they're typically younger employees or employees who have been given additional responsibilities. I know you mentioned last year that you thought that was important to try to go in that direction because you want to, you train people, you want them to stay. Yeah, obviously, you want to keep people. Right. You know, we don't want to have a revolving door, and for the most part, we are pretty successful in, in keeping help. Um, there's no question. I think, you know, it's a, yes. these are good jobs and we have, I think, competitive pay and we have good benefits. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't want to make it such that, seem such that, you know, people are just, you know, demanding, hey, I'm ready to go down the road. But there are other municipalities that we compete with. And, you know, in some of the higher um, skill levels, like, water treatment plant, sewer treatment plant operators, uh, there's demand for those and, you know, there's, uh, 
we're not the highest uh, on the compensation scale by any stretch of the imagination. Do we normally uh, do it as a percent or a dollar amount? You're talking about for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, I don't think there's been a, a normal, so you can. I think the so, trustees uh, were looking at two and a half percent as that would be you know, fine with us. It would be about twenty. $2,500. Clearly, I mean, ask your, make your points and stuff. Oh, no, I, I had spoken to Bill here a week or so ago, um, possibly uh, coming up with some solution to address this for, <laughs> for longer than a year. Um, so that it, um, something that might benefit him moving forward and, and uh, kind of take it off our our list of things to do uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, but it didn't sound like, uh, after researching a little bit of it, that there was uh, anything that was going to work well for both the town and for him. So uh, at this point, we're back to square one. Uh, and um, so you're saying, Skip, based on his your current salary um, that the 2.5 that's what we were thinking yeah would you know would be fine with us any of the other boards have any consideration i guess i i would think more along the lines of the inflation rate um the, the inflation rate gets you to 107.989 so it's about 108 the uh, uh, 2.5 gets to 108, 412, which is about, so let's just say, difference between 108 and 108, 4. But really, the inflation rate is no raise at all. That's just kind of keeping even. Well, that may be so. Um, I just read a letter today that state employees had negotiated to try to get 2%, and um, we were told we're getting 1.35%. <laughs> so if, just for what it's worth, and in, they're pushing it back six months. I was a state employee months. for a long time and lived with those, and Lefty and I get Social Security that doesn't even get the same inflation. And I think employees are your best uh, asset and things, and you need to treat them like they're you know, they're really valuable, and where would we be without them? And I think, you know. Well, I think that's across the board in any consideration, whether it's municipal or private. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I have a quick question. Bill, how does your salary work moving forward? Was it split between the two entities? I should know that, but I can't remember. So I'm a, for the purpose of payroll, I'm a town employee, okay. but in the budget there's a, there's a transfer from the village to the town, so um, I can't remember exactly. It's not just for me. So all the office staff uh, in this building, except for Bill Woodruff, are, are paid by the town. Uh, Karen is the tax clerk, and she's the utility billing clerk. Um, we help town and village and water and sewer customers and everything else. So. The village as a whole, there's a transfer from the village's general government to the town, there's a transfer from the water and sewer to the town, and there's a formula in place that we have used. It's a little less of a transfer this year because the police department has gone away and it's less administrative work for me to do on, on that side of things. But that was already built into the budget. But it's all, it's all in the budget, so the village, uh, people in the village pay a little bit more you know, as an individual taxpayer because they're paying the town tax and the village tax, so. But they don't get it for nothing. And that's been about 10 years that that's been in effect, I believe. Well, the current formula, but there's there's been a transfer from the village to the town as at least as long as I've been here for, for that. It's, the formula has been tweaked a couple of different times over the years.
So, um, Jane, you stated what now? You were interested in Well, I just, seeing... I don't want to split hairs, but I just, I mentioned that maybe the cost of living increase was 2.1%, and then Skip chimed in with some different thoughts on that. And Mark, your point was? I was just explaining what that difference really was. So it's about a $400 difference. Between 2.5 and 2.1? Yeah, it's, the, it's maybe like 450 or something like that. My math, quick math correctly. Maybe we should get more. No, I mean between the two options of 2.1 and what it does. I have to look what the uh, 2.1 is. 2232 or something like that, or a little, something, maybe a little less than that. And the other one's, so, I'm talking a little over 2,000, and the other one's, whatever that difference is, almost three. So I mean, I don't think we need to split hairs. I'm fine at the two and a half percent, personally. And the rest of the board, any input? Um, I'm still relatively new here, but uh, from the work that I've seen uh, Bill do uh, over the past year that I've been here, um, as well as understanding uh, the workload demands of this particular position, if you were to parse this down to hours worked, um, you might be making minimum wage from 1970, 1975. Um, I, I don't have any objections to the uh, recommendation that the trustees proposed. I think the difference between uh, the inflation rate uh, number we were kicking around and the other one is, um, is not, not worth dallying over. Um, I think um, being able to keep pace with inflation and to echo something that Skip had mentioned, the um, uh, public sector tends not to be very generous with um, uh, providing uh, wages um, and wage increases. And certainly over the years that you uh, were foregoing any sort of uh, increase in salary, I think it's, it's certainly reasonable of us to keep pace with the, the rate of inflation and recognize the, uh, the additional work that you, you provide the community. So be careful if inflation goes to 10%. There you go. <laughs> that I wouldn't us. wish that on anyone. <laughs> I was going to say, don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might be surprised. <clears throat> that's why, I guess that's why the, the consideration when I spoke to Bill about possible efforts to jump the gun and provide him something now that would benefit him for a few years to come in anticipation of maybe, I mean, we're supposedly in a strong economy right now. I, I beg to differ at times. If you want to uh, Google in uh, usdebtclock.org, it'll uh, surprise the hell out of you um, what the condition of this country's in. But closer to home, um, trying to, uh, Know, work something out with him that would have been more long term would have would have made me happier. But under the circumstances, um, I guess there's no there's no reason to. Uh, well, I I appreciate your sentiment, and I did think about it a little bit. But in all fairness, I mean, uh, I don't have an employment agreement. I've never had one. I'm a old fashioned traditional municipal manager, and you know I serve at the at the will of the board and, and uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to put the town and the village in a position of giving me something now and then either I don't live up to it or for whatever reason I end up having to leave. So uh, I think this is just an annual right. evaluation. That's really the and that's the way the other employees are yeah. also. So I'll make a motion to um, Approve the 2.5% that was discussed. I'll second. Okay. Motion has been made to uh, give Bill an increase for this year of 2.5%. Uh, um, <laughs> as recommended, and uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Trustees? Aye. Aye. 
Yeah, I move to approve a 2.5% raise for the municipal manager the ensuing year. A second it. Motion's been made and seconded to approve a 2.5% uh, uh, salary increase for the municipal manager for the ensuing year. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Now I guess I would just add to Chris's point that if we were going to do that, we probably needed to start before yesterday to kind of work out and I guess I would caution too there, you know, if hopefully if the village goes away, there can be some changes coming and things that, you know, could be worked in in the future that we don't necessarily know how they're all going to shake out there now. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it was, it was a thought. You know. Yep. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Still not catching up here, but, uh, Moving forward, we uh, have a little discussion on 51 South Main Street. Mr. Parsons is here tonight. Um, I think uh, I may have dropped the ball there last week there when I uh, suggested putting it on the agenda and uh, didn't want to catch you off guard. But um, as we had agreed that the voters at town meeting to uh, include perhaps some more money to the till, um, didn't know if the uh, trustees had had some time to mull that over and maybe discuss it a little bit with Mr. Parsons and uh, kind of like to have an update as to whether we're wasting our time or not. Well, the trustees are always happy to talk to you about it. <laughs> and uh, we have had uh, uh, a number of discussions on it. Of course, our village meeting was after your town meeting. So by the time we had village meeting, we were aware of the uh, the motion and that village meeting, um, you know, it we brought it up, um, and the the motion, as I remember, it was thirty-seven five. But in order to do that, you needed to get a ninety-nine year lease on any parking spaces, and in my dealings with. Uh, you know, real estate and things, if you have a 99-year lease, it amounts to you owning it. And, uh, you know, if we were going to be dealing with 30 or 40 potential parking spaces at 51 and you kicked in your 37.5, you had to get a 99-year lease for those parking spaces or a pretty minimal amount. Um, that, you know, we thought that's kind of a non-starter would anybody you know who accepted a you know if we accepted the town's uh, offer of the 37.5 out of part of a hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand parcel and you got a 99 year lease that was a really good deal in things um, and we have since um, you know I've talked a little bit to Chris Parson who's here and uh, you know, uh, we were hoping that kind of, if moving forward, we're not in a position to say we're ready to what we want to do with the lot at this point anyway. Um, we told the village voters at village meeting that we were looking into real costs for removing the uh, hazardous materials that are there, which I've done and it's about $6,000. Uh, we need a couple of write-offs to do that. We're probably going to put out an RFP to, you know, take the building down and fill it in and, uh, you know, trying to maximize the uh, recyclable of the amount of materials and things at the same time doing it at the least cost and then kind of see where we are in terms of, uh, you know, maybe adjusted purchase price or something. The other thing that is in the back of our mind, what's happening to the PD Bank parking lot. Is it going to continue to be available or not? Um, you know, Main Street has been put off till next year, and we were committed to trying to make sure it was available for, um, you know, parking during Main Street reconstruction. And it might make a difference 
if the bank is still available for parking either during daytime or after hours or is that shut off uh, wanting to know kind of what the situation was with that before we maybe uh, reached a decision so um, we're still weighing those things um, I, I don't think it's not our recommendation to take your know, 37 5 and and you know go toward the parking Chris is here tonight I <coughs> mentioned it to him I you know I don't know that he was excited about that um, and I, I think long term we were hoping that through the village and negotiating um, any arrangement that we would get some agreement to get those parking spaces available after hours at no cost to the town or the municipality rather than you know having the town buy it and things another thing that we were looking at was uh, could the lot be subdivided and if the town really wanted spaces and um, Chris could you know use less than the full lot to do what he wanted to do and there was room for parking could that you know be subdivided and still meet all the zoning permits and if it could see what you know a price um, you know for that might be if that was uh, something to look at there um, we got comments at village meeting that they really liked the idea of using uh, 51 South Main for what had been proposed, the multiple uses that Chris had presented to us, and have it available for potentially up to 40 parking spaces after hours and things, and that they really like the idea of the multiple use. I know there has been uh, some people in town that would like the town just to go buy it and use it for parking, but there are others that think maybe multiple uses. Uh, something that's advantageous too so um, and Lefty and Manley can add whatever you want to well, your thoughts on that or did you get any any information about that subdivision concept uh, only what Steve said was uh, we have to determine what it is that Chris would be actually trying to put in so we'd know exactly how many parking spaces he would need for whatever project he would have if we wanted to divide it. And Chris is here tonight. You're welcome to add anything you want to the <laughs> discussion or, you know, I, he expressed an interest that he's still you know, interested in moving forward as soon as, you know, possible there. And, you know, we're kind of committed to moving along and, you know, maybe smaller steps and knowing where we are. Um, I think you know we did that parking study and uh, you know they recommended uh, talking getting some arrangements with a potentially TD Bank and the Northfield Bank I don't think TD Bank was really interested in talking to us but I guess I would hope that the select board maybe had to move forward with talking with the Northfield Bank about you know after hours parking that's an important piece of space and uh, the sooner that you get some arrangement with them, the better we are. And that was a recommendation out of the parking study. <coughs> well, I think to Karen's point there at town meeting, when she said, you know, 99 year lease, uh, there, I don't believe there was any specifics pertaining to um, what that meant. I mean, define, define parking. We, it could be any number of things. It could be a one hour a day parking for 99 years. It could be after hours parking for 99 years. Um, I don't know that that was specified in the town meetings discussion as to what the 99 years included, you know? Um, so but it would be a 99 year lease that whoever Exactly. So that's property, my next. It had so, to be maintained, and you couldn't change the use. So that's my next point. If Mr. Parsons um, was in agreement with that, you relinquish the property to him. Um, that kind of lets you off the hook, um, because then it's his responsibility after that, as far as if the negotiations can be made prior to the agreement being settled. Um, 
based on however the 99 year part is constructed if the owner's happy with it, I wouldn't see why you guys wouldn't be happy as well. But that's just my two cents. Yeah, and I want to follow up too because Chris had called me prior to town meeting to talk about this idea of, of this amendment to the budget. And he has a good point that, you know, the longer this property sits in the village hands, the the longer we're not creating income for the grand list. And so I think that these opportunities with developers that are listening to kind of the box we're building them into and if they're really considering um, with those specifics, specific to road construction, protecting the parking during that time and then the idea of you know having a significant building with a significant tax roll but also would have parking usage at specific high peak hours. I mean, I feel like that's a pretty pretty good opportunity for us that I would hate to see we lose um, if we sit too much longer on this property. So I think that I was excited to hear Chris bring that up and I thought it was a pretty good argument for why it would make sense from a town to make that investment anticipating that we would see that return in the grand list income from from it being on the tax roll. So. I hope that you guys are taking that into account as you you think about this and the time that's passing and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So just so you know, and the other thing, and, and it's it's none of my concern. I'm just trying to put this thing together. Um, you you know, ultimately you'll do what you want. But uh, I can tell you right now that uh, I had a contractor from Newport come down to uh, Waterbury here the other day because he's going to be building up a. a place in my uh, subdivision there on, on the hill. And um, he was suggesting that uh, prices are starting to skyrocket pretty good. Um, and he was throwing out some numbers there as to what it was costing him for uh, in his bidding process. Um, and one, one of the items just off the top of my head, he said two by tens have gone from $1.21 a foot to $1.91 a foot. Or no, dollar ninety six a foot. So, um, and I'm seeing it everywhere. It's uh, so the longer, the longer this, and the economy is headed in that direction. Um, anytime you have an economy that is doing better, prices start to rise and in inflation starts to uh, take place. Um, and from a feasibility standpoint being in the business that I'm in, uh, I know that if the numbers don't work, the project just isn't going to move forward. So I know, I, not speaking for Chris himself, but I think probably he's got, um, he's got his eye on that ball as well. And uh, as time goes on, um, it may just ultimately push him out of the running. Not that that doesn't mean that there isn't more people that may come along later on, but um, Again, it's more people who may not be interested in, in helping the town out with parking, so. So when the town made their proposal back when we asked RFPs, it seemed like it just said you were gonna use it for parking. It really didn't have a vision for the lot and anything that we had asked in our RFPs, you know, what we were gonna do with it. So I guess, is that? Your talk here seems like you've changed your mind. It's not just parking or I don't No, we, I, I think the town hasn't changed their mind. We would have, you know, I was encouraged at town meeting to make a proposal to authorize more money to, for the town to go back to the drawing board on this, but uh, um, that wasn't possible based on the laws in place. And the fact that it wasn't warned that significant amount of money so that got kicked to the side. Um, and I think at this point, I, don't, I won't speak for the rest of the board, but my opinion, um, the project he's proposing is uh, quite attractive to the town um, and it supplies the town with possibly with ample uh, parking or, or at least a significant amount of parking that we don't otherwise have. Um, are you pursuing any other options in case this doesn't pan out? Or are you well, kind of 
uh, sitting here waiting or no it's actually your property to deal right. with so yeah. our our yeah. our earlier discussion and um apologies if there was misunderstanding with that the short term was always the agreement about getting through the construction season but the longer vision was to encourage some sort of development there but also trying to reserve the ability to have some level of parking there. Um, Chris's proposal uh, actually hit those marks yeah. and, and looked great. Unfortunately, we don't have, have any say in that matter. I, I think that's what prompted Chris to uh, try to um, encourage on. that sort of discussion with the, uh, with the additional funding. Um, I, I, and I'm not sure how the rest of the board feels. My, my own perspective is I felt as though that 99-year lease piece was an anchor around the, yeah. the whole process. So given that, if you can negotiate with the parameters of that to come up with something worthwhile, I think as a, as a body, we're still willing to support that concept. <laughs> yeah, and I think I mean, that's kind of the direction where we were still you know, pursuing mm -hmm. the you know, the offer of the 120 or 125 was less than where, you know, we were. And, uh, you know, some of the unknowns there, um, you know, taking down the building that Main Street now has kind of stretched out and, you know, just how many spaces. Chris has talked about uh, the length of time to get his plans and permits too, You're, you know, and things, so. And I think back to your question, we changed our position I don't think we necessarily have but we're not in the business of being a landlord so I think we felt like we were backs against the wall a little bit to try to get an offer in for the RFP and we presented the offer based on what we felt we could do as a town to make that offer but if if I have the two scenarios put in front of me and I put my business hat on I think the scenario that there's an opportunity to capture parking spaces, but also have the income from property tax of a significant building versus us buying and trying to build that parking lot out of town money and then maintaining that parking lot, et cetera, et cetera. I think that the scenario of the public-private partnership is a much better scenario that makes a lot more sense for not only, I would say, the town, but also I would hope you would see that as well. You would see more income from the utility district. I just think that there's there's better opportunity there. Um, I do agree that the 99 year thing really did throw a wrench in it. Um, you know, what we could do moving forward, I, mean, I guess we could call a special meeting to discuss it further. We could call a special meeting to see if we could then re-propose that we buy it as a town and then um, put it back out to RFP and include Chris's offer, but I would hate to see us have to do that. Um, but I don't know. I guess it's there's a lot of moving parts in that scenario. Yeah, um, I appreciate what you just said, and I agree with what you said very much about if you put the two things side by side with the offer that we made quickly, kind of at the uh, you know December, early January, whatever that deadline was, and we were just doing that because we wanted to. We didn't want to have. But we wanted to preserve the parking, and we wanted some offer to be players in this somehow. If we needed to be, if you got, especially if you got no other offers, and instead you got this um, proposal, which, to me, it had all the, as you, someone said, it hit all the all the marks, and it was an attractive building that looked like it could be multi-use, and give you the parking too, and was willing to be this partnership where you could phase it in and still get through the Main Street reconstruction. So, um, it, you know, it, the monkey wrench at the town meeting was to somebody proposed putting the 99 year on there and now we're kind of stuck with that. Um, I don't know if you could negotiate this without our 37,500 so you don't feel encumbered. I can certainly understand you doing that. Um, I think I think it'd be a shame to, I'm a proponent of, I, th I hope you can work something out because I think this looks like a great proposal and I'd like to see it happen sooner rather than later because I think the longer time goes on, um, the other things can come in the way <laughs> to mess it up. And maybe, you know, as Lefty said, um, I think you said something, you talked to Steve about um, using 
trying to get the figures, I think, from, I mean, do you have a sense of what the use of the building might be that you could figure out parking well, and <coughs> work something out? With Chris's proposal. The square we footage. Would, we would have to figure out just how many parking spaces he would have to have reserved for the permitting process. Yeah. And the rest of them would be open to negotiate. That's the thing. So uh, just to let you know, the reason I came up with the number that I did was based on the fact that I assumed, I guess, the cost of tearing down the building that you people would perhaps have to incur. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason I decided to ask the voters for that additional money was because of the time restraints that I felt based on the economy and the inflation and interest rates and all that, that accumulatively over time, <clears throat> you know, makes these projects less possible that to uh, ultimately perhaps get you at the number that you would be at by the time you got done tearing down that and uh, uh, get him, get his foot in the door at perhaps a quicker time period would make both parties happy. That was the whole premise of the, the reason I came up with the number I did and the, the philosophy behind it was to uh, expedite the project and, and uh, get it moving. Um, so cause the quicker it's in place, the more beneficial it is to everybody. So. Well, with, with the <coughs> parking part, uh, a Russian has so many required for the number right. of seats and how, how many there are different office personnel. So you'd have to come up with a general total before you would have any way to know, go forward to the parking. Right. So I don't. I don't necessarily think, from my opinion, that uh, you know the negotiation process should be thrown out the door on this because I think there's a few variables that can be put into this thing to uh, to to make both parties happy, meaning you guys and them, because we're just you know, all we're doing is adding a little bit of financial effort here to. Uh, try to make everybody happy. So uh, that's it in a nutshell, I guess. I mean, cheerleaders. Something to consider. <laughs> Did we say how many parking spaces we wanted to have for 99 years? No, that was not in the <laughs> amendment. <laughs> so there again. So that, again, it's definition. You know, yeah, one really like sweet <laughs> parking space. <laughs> one, 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 yeah, one small parking one beautiful space. space with a nice <laughs> sign. Well, I, don't think the board, I don't think the select board is going to jump all over that one, but uh, you know, we probably can. I just couldn't remember if it was prescriptive or not. The better part would be that the space is landlocked, but <laughs> it's yours for 99 years. <laughs> so Chris, do you have anything you'd like to say at all in reference to the conversation? He could go to here? the mic, too. Uh, with some sort of language, you know, about the parking that everybody was happy with, because, you know, obviously from the outset, that was, you know, one of our points was we understood that was a huge deal, and that was, you know, one of the, you know, major concessions that we were, you know, wanting to make, um, is that we were, you know, more than willing to put something together that everybody was happy with as far as the parking was concerned. And, you know, the more that I get into this, the more that I see that that's going to be easy to do. I was talking to a guy today um, who was interested in having about 2,000 square feet of office space in there, you know, and he said we really only need, you know, three or four parking spots until 5 o'clock in the evening, you know, so I mean, that's a big chunk of the building that doesn't really require much and those people are out of there at five o'clock, you know, so I think so the parking's gonna be, you know, it, it'll be loose, there'll be a lot available and I'm sure that we can put something together in writing that everybody would be comfortable with and, and happy about. Um, with 99 years. Somewhere. So, in all, in all, fair, in all fairness, yeah, I, I think the board would agree that uh, if we were to sit down and have a discussion about this, that um, we would also take into consideration possible future change in, changes in use or, you know, any of those number of things there that we wouldn't want to gridlock you into, 
you know, a situation where you come up, like Lefty says, you know, you'd want ample. And being aware, too, that anything the village says is not restricted by the 99 years. Say that again. Yeah, but anything the village the would do, any contract we do, oh. we're, not, we're not obligated under oh. that 99 years. Because it deals with them. <laughs> if we don't accept their money. Hello. Yeah, right. right. But if we accept their money, then that is 99 right. years and whatever the terms are becomes part of the purchase right, and right. sale. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess. And back to my point there, if you relinquish ownership of it, then, you know, and, and, and the new, the new owner is totally happy with that. And I, I think but there's room here to make yeah. it try to work. So. But it's up, to, you know, that's up to you. Guys. How many parking spaces are you thinking? I think, you know, currently as this initial plan has been laid out, I think there's 52, you know, total. and. Um, as the current plan is laid out, you know, we probably would reserve 12 of those, you know, every day, uh, but the remainder of those could kind of be in the public pool, you yeah. know, for people to use just, you know, as we're doing with the bank right now. So, um, uh, it'd be, you know, a, a good portion of the 52 spaces, basically, that were kind of, you know, open to everybody, so. And there would be people using the building during the daytime, you know, like we were saying, and, you know, obviously, the people that show up at seven o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock to go to work in there, or whatever, you know, they might be doing, they're obviously gonna have a empty parking lot to choose from. They'll be taking care of, you know, whatever spots are left over during the day, you know, people can kind of, you know, uh, avail themselves of. Uh, and then, you know, at five o'clock at night when everybody leaves, then it kind of opens up again, you know. So, um, I think it's. So, based on what you've heard here tonight, there's not a huge deal breaker standing in front of you as far as you're concerned? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I got, I just, you know, the, the 99 year thing, you know, like Skip was saying, that's, you know, almost as if, Ownership is with somebody else of you know that chunk, and I don't know how that plays out. With they would buy it over those terms. Yeah. Perspective so. wise, I mean, how many spaces is that compared to TD or any you know the lot out behind Mansfield? I mean, what are we talking in size here? I think the Mansfield is about. 40 spaces back there. The TD Bank, they said they had. A, I think more spaces than if you actually go over there and look. I think they included almost a few parked through the entire like drive through. Mm. Um, I think it was like 12, 12, 22, about like 35 spaces, I would say, around there. And I have heard that that might be monetized in the near future. Mm. Yeah, okay. But not going away, but monetized. Mm. <laughs> so, if there's any other comments or questions? Okay, that's in your Thanks. hands, guys. Thank you. Thanks for your We're leaders. Thank you for Appreciate coming it. tonight. Thank you. We want to adjourn. I move we adjourn. You second it? I second it. Yep. Eight forty-five. Adjourn at eight forty. Eight forty-four. Four. Don't know. We're off. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, we enjoyed having you, Skip. Anytime. Yeah, hindsight, I wish I would have fought that amendment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, select board business, town meeting debriefing from Mr. Kilgore. been a lot said about town meeting and I just wanted to let you know what some of my thoughts were. I've uh, thought a lot about town meeting since 
town meeting day. I've read a lot, talked to a number of folks, and I guess probably one conclusion that I think I feel comfortable in articulating is I think to the extent that there was criticism about the kind of conversation and debate that happened at the meeting, I'm probably as responsible for as anyone else because philosophically, I tend to let people speak and I don't interrupt. Um, I have always thought that um, if, if something is inappropriate and if you interrupt and mention that something is inappropriate, you can, you can almost do more damage to calling attention to it than just by letting it go. And so, um, as I said, I tend to be quite liberal in letting folks talk. And I know at one point during the debate on the, on the motion to limit debate on the gun resolution, Carla looked over at me and Carla said to me, you know, they're talking about the merits of the motion. And I said, I know that. But I think that people want to talk about it. And at that point in time, I was quite frankly pretty confident that the motion to uh, sustain the position of the moderator would carry. And I felt that it was more important not to alienate the folks that didn't show up at the meeting than it was to alienate the folks that were there. So that was probably uh, a little more calculating than I, tend to, than I tend to be as far as letting people speak. So those are, those are the thoughts that I have about what happened. And I think perhaps I need to change my style as moderator. Um, a lot of people don't understand that unlike radio engineers, a moderator does not have a button that can bleep people. Because like it or not, town meetings are live. Like theater, theater is live. And one of the things that makes live theater so enjoyable is that it is live and anything can happen. And anything did happen at town meeting this year. And in part, I take the blame for that. And so my conclusion is that at subsequent meetings, I need to be less tolerant about letting people speak. Now, why is that in the end, uh, it was, wasn't sustained? Pardon me? The, in the end about that discussion, uh, about the gun policy or gun letter, it, it wasn't sustained. Oh, it was. It, it, it was. was. That's, that's the big confusion, I think, for a lot decision, of people that walked out of that meeting. The decision of the moderator was that the resolution was out of order, and that that's passed. Right. So that's why yes, I say. That's what passed. I say, and, and the result was, was that there could not be a vote. Yeah on the resolution, which there was, and there was no vote on the resolution. So in that regard, the decision of the moderator was sustained because I ruled that the resolution was out of order. But allowing the, I think this is what I kind of struggled with is, I understood that the only thing we really should be arguing are the merits of the motion, but we got into arguing guns. I know, I know. And I, I, I do agree I that, agree. A lot of people wanted to talk, but my fear was that continuing to allow the back and forth on guns confused the audience 
that what we're really talking about is the merits of the motion, and you can even see it in the paper asking, because now that it was added to the following select board meeting and discussed, those discussions didn't really happen as much that night in the select board meeting as in town meeting. And then the feeling of the community that, no, we voted that down in town meeting, but we didn't really vote it down in town meeting. We voted that we sustained your decision. That's right. Right? That's right. You're absolutely and right. And that's a, that's a confusing right. thing, I think, to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we would, it would be at, people would be as confused if people would have been halted from conversation on guns because really we should have been discussing the merits of the motion. I, I, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree at all. But I do believe that when it came time to vote, the way it was explained, it was crystal clear as to what people were voting on. I'm wondering, yeah, and, and I, 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 do, I did feel that way, but I'm just wondering then it's, maybe it's this telephone game in the community of what was really mm -hmm. decided in town. And, and, and so that, that goes into part, that goes part of my reasoning why I think if I get elected as moderator at subsequent meetings and because I'm the moderator for, sounds like you may have another meeting this year, who knows. Mm -hmm is that I need to be a lot more strict about what people can say and when. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from with that. I think uh, from what I saw and heard, uh, I think there was confusion over what sustain meant. Mm -hmm. um, it, sustain has a very specific meaning and I think it, it got a little garbled. That being said, um, the crowd was small enough and respectful enough and you gave everybody the opportunity to have their say in the discussion and I thought that was valuable. I, I do think um, there was the opportunity for some folks to be confused over it because it did wander off track but I thought it was a good opportunity for those folks to weigh in on the issue. And we heard a pretty good cross-section of, of discussion there. So I, I actually uh, want to thank you for providing that opportunity for that crowd. Um, if you had closed off uh, the conversations, I think uh, your observation from earlier in that that would um, send a chill through the crowd, and it would also uh, not resolve the the issue that needed to be discussed at that point. Um, so I think it, uh, like with any work of art, the more you refine it, the better it looks. Um, I, I don't disagree with the way you handle that. Um, going forward, if you feel it's more appropriate to tighten that up, um, that's fine, uh, but don't feel as though uh, it was an egregious mistake because I don't think it was. And I'm not trying to no. articulate that, but I think the, the, my one comment would be is I didn't speak because I felt like we should only be discussing the merit of the motion, and I would have. And I'm wondering if that was an opportunity to explain, again, the merit of the motion and then ask, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask the select board to consider it or we say, we will put it on the next select board meeting. I think that there was, I've heard comments of, well, how dare the select board bring it up again? But to me it was, this was out of order. This is obviously an important thing to discuss in the community, let's put it on the next agenda. But that wasn't discussed in the town meeting at all of putting it on the agenda at the subsequent meeting. So to me, that's where I felt like I shouldn't speak on my position on what was asked because we should only be speaking to the merit of the motion. I'd like to ask you a question. If that referendum had been brought to the select board, put on the agenda and, and brought in front of the select board as timely as the referendum signing that you guys uh, signed to send to the state house, uh, how many people do you suppose would have shown up to that meeting as I mean, it was clear to me that the public 
was interested in having more conversation about this whole thing at a maybe a, perhaps a much better warned uh, meeting than being pulled out of the back pocket of someone um, at the 11th hour um, just basically took everybody off guard. Uh, that's why I signed no on that referendum because in my opinion, the public was clear about wanting another stab at this thing even though the, the question was called out of order and that's why, in my opinion, they wanted another crack at this thing in a professional hearing that was done properly and they didn't get that. So, but I agree with Mark. I mean, I think you, you handled it well, uh, in my opinion. And um, yeah, I mean, things kind of got a little bit sidetracked there for a bit, but uh, I think you gave reasonable time for people to express some of their opinion. And it was clear to me that they wanted to have a, a more solid conversation about this with more people informed. Well, just so that it's clear, that wasn't the only thing that happened at the meeting that was Absolutely. not exactly appropriate. Okay, let me just say one thing about the, the topic. Um, I, I would agree with, with Mark um, that, I mean, in a way, I think it was okay. I don't think it was just the people who didn't understand the merits of the motion. I think, in a way, they ignored them because they wanted to talk about the. They wanted to talk about it, yeah. and it was a topic. It had just it was two weeks after you know the uh, Parkland shooting, a little more than two weeks, and I just think people have felt because it was uh, mentioned they they wanted to express themselves. Well, there was there was a lot that was going on. A lot was going on. A lot was going on. And, so I don't know whether I made the and it was yeah. a pretty conscious decision on my part right. to let them speak. And I probably shouldn't have. Possibly shouldn't have. But, but in I the did, end, but if, I did but in I, the but end, if it was sustained, and I guess I was getting a little confused with the words myself, so that um, you think that it was wrong because in the end it was sustained anyway? No, 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 no. I guess what was what was sort of going through my mind was, I am a huge supporter of town meeting. Mm -hmm. And some of the best debate we've had at town meeting was um, the special town meeting we had. And then while it was a little bit more rowdy, the meeting that we had when the first item on the warning was what to do about the police department, I think we had four or 500 people at the meeting. Mm -hmm. And there was discussion. And the people talked about an issue that was important to them. And they did so in a reasonably good manner. Um, the special town meeting we had in January was a textbook case in talking about issues and only issues. And I thought the folks that were there, there were maybe 200 people at that meeting, were, and, and I think I said this to a number of people, it was one of the best town meetings <laughs> I've attended because of, the, because of the level of debate. And because I'm a firm believer in town meeting, I do not believe in the philosophy that someone said at the meeting, well, they weren't here, and that's too bad. They should have stayed for the entire meeting. I don't believe in that because it wasn't warned that we were going to discuss it. And that would, I think if you had warned that as the last item on the ballot, you'd have had 700 people at the meeting. And you would have had, instead of 35 to 40 people talking, you'd have had 300 people talking. I see and, your point. And so I'm concerned about town meeting. I don't want people to say, well, look what they talked about, and we didn't even know about it. So I was more concerned about letting, making sure that that resolution was not binding on the select board 
a lot of people came up to me and said, thank you, I'm glad you support no gun regulation. And I never said how I felt. And I'm still not going to say how I feel because I don't believe that that's the role of a moderator. I, I, I'm a firm believer that moderators don't have a right to choose well, because to that, they have to be so impartial. we probably should have had another meeting. To that, point, to that point and your point, if we'd had another um, um, official meeting on that particular item and it was the majority ruled that they were in favor of that re referendum, I would have signed it in a heartbeat. But because we never had that opportunity, I couldn't, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't go along with it. Well, that's what, you know, everybody has their individual ideas on the way things work. And at the time, mine was, I think it's more important that a small group of people, I hate to use this expression, but I think this is what would have happened. I don't think it was appropriate when we had a couple hundred people that started off at the meeting for less than a quarter of the meeting to impose their will on the town. And I don't care which way they were going, and I don't care what the issue is. Um, and, but I think what might be helpful in the future is if a couple of weeks before the deadline for petitions to be filed with the select board for consideration of, war of uh, warning items, that you put something in the front page forum and let people know that. Because maybe, I mean, granted, that date was predated, um, predated the uh, Parkland shooting by probably close to a month, mm -hmm. but I think there are lots of items that people want to bring up. And under the, I think it's the South Burlington decision, <coughs> it's, um, it's entirely within the province of the folks that want to see items on the ballot, if the select board agrees with them, to put it on the ballot. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not ballot, to put it on the warning. But how many, is it 30 days before? No, no, it's like the middle of January. So it's we like six weeks. Of things warned. No, we have to have petitions in by the middle of January. Yeah. The warning has to be done at the end of January. End of January. But I guess my question is: is we as a select board have to make the decision on what is important enough to call a special meeting to discuss, right? And the resolution was warned in the last meeting. It was on the agenda. Warned and no one showed up. So my question is, is we almost call attention, we have to make a decision on any topic. We, we make decisions for the town on a constant basis. And what gets a special meeting and what doesn't? And I don't, I mean, I think that if you, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the question. We sit here as a jury of our peers to make a decision for not only ourselves, but hopefully for what we believe is the correct decision for the town. And that's why I was hoping for more attendance in the last meeting for more discussion, but no one did show up and it was, it was to me a resolution that wasn't asking for much in specifics, but just showing that we, we recognize that this event happened. We, certain of us, certain members of the select board believe that it is important that Montpelier take it seriously and work on solutions. So I, I don't know, you know, in terms of timing, I think it was the right timing to get something down to Montpelier. Obviously, with the timing of what's happening in Montpelier, I think it was right. Um, I don't know, should we have called a special meeting? Sure, I think people would have shown up and we would have, discuss it for a long time, but I don't think I particularly would have been swayed from how the amendment was st stated to do anything differently with it. Well, so, bear in mind, I'm not making any comment whatsoever about what you did at that select board meeting. Sure. 
No, I my understand, comment, I understand that. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not just necessarily yeah, talking comment, to you. I mean, you're looking at me as you're saying this. My comments go exclusively to what happened at, the, at town meeting. That's all, that's all I'm talking about. But to, Mark, to your point, Mark, um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to the question that you posed. I, you know, there'll be some who debate, but I think the statements that were made at the select board meeting, you're elected by the people of this community and you're elected to use your judgment, you're elected to, to pass public policies or resolutions that you think are beneficial to the community. And I think the, I think the legislature is capable of understanding the difference between a resolution of the select board, when you say we the select board of the town of Waterbury, um, you know, there's weight behind that. I think if you had the exact same resolution that, that you approved, and then if it was, uh, say it was disapproved by the town meeting, I think the legislature would be able to put weight in that to say, well, we see how the public as a whole feels and we know how the select board feels. So I don't think there was anything wrong with the select board taking the issue. And I, I think that it's impractical um, to have every question that comes before the public with regard to public policy to have to go to a town meeting. That's why there's there's typically one town meeting a year and then there's a provision for special town meetings and I think the legislature entrusts the select board to decide this rises to the level that we think we need a special town meeting for it or you know certainly the, the public has the, the right to petition a special town meeting themselves. They, they can put a petition in any time. So I don't think there was anything wrong with, with um, bringing the issue here and you know there was at least one member of the public here who's who let you know how they <laughs> how he felt felt about it and and I uh, you know appreciate Everett's attendance circling back though to to your point about that question and <clears throat> exciting and good town meetings uh, you know I'm not sure any of you are familiar with uh, Frank Bryan who was a professor at UVM He's Tired now. Uh, he co authored a book uh, 30 years ago, Real Monsters Don't Milk Goats. And, uh, you know, he has been a student of town meeting for a long, long time and has done a lot of research on it. And he sent graduate students out into the field to observe town meetings for years and years and years and, and has made several statements about it. And the one thing that he is consistent about, you know, he talks about. There does seem to be a sweet spot where a town meeting works best to the size of the communities and, you know, a community the size of Burlington or even Essex, it's, it's not that great, but, you know, uh, when you get smaller, it can be very good. But the point that he's made often is that town meetings are best when you allow the voters to make real decisions. And he, in, in one sense, and I heard him speak a couple of different times, he said sometimes you towns who have chosen the manager form of government, you've made it too professional and you don't really allow the public as much opportunity to make decisions as you should. He said, you know, you're a professional manager, you're good at budgets, and you end up putting everything in the budget. So, you know, we had a budget, I forget what the, the numbers were, you know, a big number for the general fund budget, a big number for the highway fund budget, and then we roll in, the, the next one talks about the, the capital improvement budgets, and it's just a big number that we throw out there. And um, we've had this conversation in the past, but one of the things that could be considered is to say, well, Rather than just have one article that says, you know, here's all the capital improvement projects that we're going to do, and, and they add up to, you know, $1.5 million, maybe you want to take a few of the 
ones out and had a specific article about the roads or paving and, and let the public have some meat to chew on as opposed to just you package everything in such a neat package and you know I, I get a lot of um, uh, personal fulfillment when people do ask questions about the budget but it's a pretty big and complicated document to, to really compose a lot of questions and I think we can answer almost all the questions that get answered but maybe we should think about breaking some of it down a little bit and giving the people smaller chunks and they can help us identify what their priorities are as opposed to just saying well your only opportunity is to either make a motion to you know reduce the budget by something because you don't want to spend money for that particular program or well we're going to add money because we want a recreation director or what have you if you split the budget apart a little bit um, there's some there's if some the there's paving some topic. there's some restrictions i mean you can't separate you know the, the court's been pretty clear your general fund budget is your general fund budget and you know, you can't put up the fire department budget as an individual budget and the recreation budget as an individual budget. You've got to put your budget up. But when it comes to some of the capital expenditures, I think there's an opportunity that you can get more input than we've been having. So, so one last comment, unless somebody else has got something to say afterwards, circling back <coughs> to your point about the elected officials, you know, dealing with some of these concerns and questions about what that the public may have. I believe, for me personally, on, on this particular one uh, issue, that it was uh, such a, of such delicate nature that it deserved a bit more due process than what, what the public were allowed. So um, it should have been advertised either in the paper or as a special meeting or something other than just so few people look at the agenda. Um, that's why we have a packed room every Monday night. But, uh, anyway, um, anybody else got any other further comments? No, I just say I think Bill's um, what, what you mentioned is an interesting idea, and maybe the time to, to parse that out would be in January doing the budget. If there's some. Maybe before January. Or December, yeah. The budget if you if you're thinking about breaking up the budget article I'd love to work with you because there are all kinds of different ways that that other communities can do it that passes muster and I'd be more than happy to sit down and show you what some of the other towns Is that do like an October November kind of discussion probably Kind of work it around your schedule. Ah, just <laughs> <laughs> be a long phone call, probably. Well, Jeff, like okay. always, we appreciate Thank you. you coming in. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Is you. there anything else you wanted to say? Nope. Enjoy having you as moderator. Thanks. It's fun. <laughs> Keep coming back. <laughs> Thanks. Try not to step on my tie next year. <laughs> Okay, uh, one other question before we adjourn that I've been kind of scratching my head about. Um, we had spoken during budget season about uh, issues pertaining to our investment portfolio and whether or not to perhaps skim a little bit more off the top before things change in the market. And can you add anything to that right now as to have we lost a fair amount? Have we gained more, are we still doing okay, or should we be considering doing something here pretty quick well, before? You know, um, I wasn't prepared to talk about it tonight. Um, nothing is, I mean, the market went down about 2% today, while the Dow Jones went down about 2% today, 600 points on a $24,000, I mean a 24,000 point. Um, average that's out there right now. Um, you know, I think, as you all know, the market has been more volatile the, 
the last two months than it has been for a very long time. We're still in uh, good shape compared to, um, you know, if you look back, it's the market has been pretty much going up. There's been some fits and starts now. Um, you know, I do try to look at the portfolio every, I keep a close eye on it, but I look to, you know, potentially rebalance um, in accordance with the investment policy at least a couple times a year. Um, try not to, you know, panic on a particular day where the market goes way up or, or maybe, uh, you know, has a, a dive. So I've got really nothing to, no specific thing that I'm planning to do based on what's happened in late. I would expect that probably sometime, probably in May, um, again, to review the investment policies with you, it'll be the first chance that Matt gets a chance to even see what that is. Um, so. Okay, well, I mean, I, my only concern was in, in where we have our money invested may be totally, I won't say totally different than what the market's been showing its volatility with lately. Uh, I mean, we were at 28 at one point, now we're down at 24. and. I'm just, my, my thought is whether we should be. I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, would, something I don't have any better years. crystal ball than you do. I, I can't sit here today to say that the market is going to go down 15% or it's going to go up 5%. Um, we've had a consistent policy and a fairly consistent application of that policy all through uh, the time that we've had an investment portfolio. There have been years, and the, you know, the tax stabilization fund is the prime example, there have been years where the tax stabilization fund has not performed well enough for us to take anything out of it the next year. And, uh, you know, I don't have the town report with me right now, but the fund opened, I want to say, in 1997 or something like that. And it's probably been five or six years where we haven't been able to take money out of it. But over the course of time, we've, I think we've probably taken $250,000 out of that fund. Um, and it started at $644,000 and it's worth probably $800,000 now, even though we've taken a quarter of a million dollars out over the last 30 years. So um, we'll review it again, Chris. Uh, I think at some point, uh, you know, there's, it's been a long time since there's, there's been a correction in the market, you know, a 10% decline uh, for a sustained period of time. At some point that's going to happen. I, I don't think it's anything that we need to panic about, though. Um, when the market dropped in 2008 and lost 50%, you know, we lost, we lost a lot of money on paper then, too. but. Uh, we had put ourselves in a little bit of a defensive position and we fared okay and then we wrote it out. We didn't panic and sell at the low point. You know, we let the market rebound and we've done okay. So I'll look at it. I'll report to the board, uh, like I say, probably in May we can have a discussion about things then. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I mentioned that, that idea of a trailing stop and maybe if that is an option that we could maybe agree that like a 10% correction auto ca goes to cash to stop the risk of a 50% downside, something like that. I don't know if that is an option for us, but if those options are available, I'd like, just like to know and maybe we can have a discussion on it. Yeah, I, just, I didn't know if there was some magical formula there that uh, you could pull out of your hat that would, you know, my concern was we were gonna use, try to use some of this, I thought, to help us out there this summer. Um, and with every downturn in the market, I don't know how how things are set up as well as you do by any stretch, but uh, whether or not we're taking risk of losing losing what we were hoping, you know, some of what we were hoping to utilize. So that's it. Yeah. I mean, no, just concern. Right. I mean, some, I mean, and, and, you know, that's a reasonable point and maybe Maybe um, that's something that I'll give a little bit of consideration to. Um, 
you know, the, the money that's in the tax stabilization fund, uh, I, I, whatever we decided to move into the general fund will be moved. Most years, if, you know, if the fund has gained, let's say it's gained enough and the formula that we have in place suggests that we can take $50,000 from the fund and, and put it into the general fund. A lot of years, you know, I don't make the I don't make the move of the money from the the tax stabilization fund to the general fund until December, and you know we didn't need the cash, uh, let it stay invested, and then at the end of the year you take it out, and, and you know you, that way the risk of missing the upside isn't lost. Now, if if it goes down, well then. Maybe you've lost an opportunity, but um, typically the way that we've managed the funds, we have done okay. And I, I don't see there's any giant risk right now of losing a whole lot. And you have to remember, too, and Mark's point is reasonable, I can ask about the trailing stop, but you know, we don't have all of our money invested. Right, I was going to ask if you, know, you knew where that was. In fixed fixed income securities that, you know, unless the bond market or the town itself fails. I mean, we've lent money to ourselves from that and we're paying interest back to ourselves, so. Well, I'm not questioning your, our typical approach. What I'm questioning is uh, issues going on outside of our right. control. I this understand. And, that and are the, making and our- Do you know approximately what the- the action you know, when, when you decide to sell, there's a 50-50 chance that you sold at the wrong time. You know, if you sell today and it goes up 15% next week. Well, well, then you don't know when to get back into the market, too. I guess that is a good question. Do you know approximately what percentage of that fund, plus or minus whatever, is, is exposed to the, just the stock market? Um, I... The... Probably it's less than 50% right now. I missed the, I, I apologize for missing the beginning of the meeting. Did, did anyone mention the, the, the fire last night? I think maybe we should just say something. No, actually, and I guess I put myself in the butt for uh, letting that one go over my head, but that was my intent to uh, originally, you know, uh, give condolences to uh, Rosina and the unfortunate fire that took place at her place Sunday evening. So, uh, from what I understand, I asked my wife there. She's been kind of keeping an eye on the on the fundraising efforts there. I don't know where the last number was, but uh, I have it right here. It sounds like uh, it's at thirty-four thousand right now. Wow! It was yeah. at seven grand this morning. Yeah, and I suspect there'll be more to come. Um, so at least people are reaching out and doing what they can, and uh, God be with her. Uh, she took a huge loss, and uh, I think uh, everybody has that on our on our minds too. So, all right. Yes, sir. Just on a quick note on that. People who live here in town in Flush Hill Estates, which is a little way to the side of Rosina and Kay's properties. Uh, I sent an email last night, and they sent an email back, and they had gone over and helped the Wallaces with days at school buses, took kids up to see how cows were milked, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, John and Debbie Thuman, the people that lived in Flush Hill Estates, he was a firefighter here as well, but uh, she said, if you can get to Rosina, tell her that we're thinking about her. Mm -hmm. She's in our prayers. And that uh, we want you to give each one of them a hug from John and myself. So I took that mission this morning. Well, you know, it's not a big deal, but I did do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, well, big to that, I'm sure. There was some other day was there this morning, was there last night, early on, um, which had helped a little bit in initial phase of the fire when she came back up from having a piece of dinner, done it one of her neighbors, and 
they had to almost possibly keep her out of going into the house, which was a good thing. Yeah. I walked the construction was there today, knocking the rest of the house down, and before that happened, the firefighters were there, and there was still four trucks there. There was, I think, five firefighters, five firefighters that stayed there overnight last night, and uh, just a very sad thing. Uh, the point we didn't only lose, but they didn't only lose the Wallace history, but we lost some Waterbury history too. But I think that's the next to the last active farm in the town. Stand corrected if I am wrong. But there are two more. Two, two, others. two left. Two Davis. Davis. What are Davis. Davis. Mark Davis. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 No. Anyway. We're losing, losing things that uh, oh, yeah. Vermont was built on. Like I said, all you're going to see is that for long, that picture on the wall. And just because I went up and did what I did, it's no big deal. Yeah. I felt like I could do it. Simmons live in South Carolina, and I sent them back an email, and they would appreciate it. That's the And all the firefighters are safe, and as far as I know. Yeah, it was an extremely, extremely perfect fire. It was huge. I saw it from the other side of the valley when I was driving out of it. Very unfortunate. Okay. So Mark, now, just, just um, I didn't realize he may had a not had a town report. So on December thirty first, the fund balance of the um, youth, uh, tax stabilization fund was nine hundred thirty five thousand, and. Um, in equities and bond funds, there was 306,000. So about a third of it is in in the stock market. So. Okay. All set. That's good. Motion to adjourn. Make a motion. I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 aye.